nice talks. Um, for those of you that didn't go to Velocity in California. Uh, first, uh, I want to thank uh, Doug from The Ladders for providing this space, pizza, beer, so thanks, guys. Um, uh, and this is more announcements also. Uh, the Ladders is also hiring, so if you want to have an interest on system administration and stuff, you talk to Doug, which is right there pointing him. Okay. Uh, also, some more announcements uh, related to Apple and Linux in general. Uh, next month, uh, the NY Lab, New York Linux User Group, uh, we are going to present about uh, Logstash, James Turbo. So, if you are looking for an open source alternative to Splunk, Logstash could be your friend. So. Make sure you attend to that, and we uh, on Puppet, uh, I'm sorry, in Meetup, there is a group for anyone log, so that's it. Uh, some more, more announcements, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to make some announcement related to Linux events in general for this month, or, um, no? Uh, Okay, yeah, I'll make a, a small announcement. Uh, the company where I work for is Guild, and we're also hiring uh, engineers, system engineers, so if you want to talk about possibilities or, or options, you know, just let me know, and we have also someone here from Guild. Um, Laurie. Can you do a question about working there? Um, okay, I think we're... So the three presentations that we have for tonight, the uh, first one is from Rob Terher. Uh, uh, he's going to talk about dynamic orchestration with PuppetDB. Uh, it's a really interesting topic, followed by James Sweeney from Puppet Labs. He will talk about uh, Puppet 3, uh, sort of review what's coming for Puppet 3, exciting. And last but not least, we have uh, Brian Kapoor. He will... Uh, uh, introduce us to uh, cloud formation from uh, Amazon Web Services. So the talk is, is titled um, "Spinning Up, Spinning Up a Stack with Cloud Formation." Uh, so, okay. So without further ado, let me just present to Rob. Thank you, Andreas. Um, my name is Robert. Rob Tahar. Um, I work with uh, Atlantic Dynamic, a small consulting company here in wonderful New York City. Do DevOps consulting, finance, biotech. Um, I've been a sysadmin for a long time, um, using Puppet for a long time also, five plus years. I'm going to be talking today about, it's a big topic, dynamic orchestration with PuppetDB without exported resources, or DOPWOER, just for short. So, the problem that we're going to be talking about, like our hypothetical pet problem, is going to be um, adding entries to our HA proxy load balancer when we're adding more web servers, right? So this is just imagine you're, you know, you have this this problem, and how are we going to solve this using Puppet? Um, here's our outline for the, for the talk. Uh, we're going to go through kind of the setup, what's going on, do a really really brief talk about what a resource actually is. Um, I know there's a lot of advanced people here, but I'm just going to touch on it really quick. Talk about what PuppetDB is, really fast exported resources, um, and then we're going to talk about how PuppetDB can help us. So um, PuppetDB is open source, Puppet is open source. The code in this presentation is open source, but it might not work. And it probably won't work, but it's, uh, it's theoretically perfect. So um, what is a resource? A lot of you are pretty advanced Puppet users, so you probably know resources. It's that atomic thing, that one thing that we're managing. It's the user account, it's the package, it's our cron entry. But is it a single line in a configuration file? We'll, we'll discuss that soon. So um, our versions that we're talking about here, we're using, uh, for our theoretical setup, um, Puppet 3.2.1, which is the latest as of today. Latest public DB as of today. Is it that? Oh yeah, there's the there's the certificate. Uh, there's the uh, the YAML thing. Everyone go upgrade. Because there's there's a so upgrade. 
the early bed security problem in 3.2.1, go get 3.2.2. .2 .2. All right, um, some of the things might or might not work with Puppet Enterprise. If you're running that, you're, there's a big disclaimer on the Puppet DB documentation, so you're on your own there, or you're up to the, the support of Puppet Labs. So, Puppet DB. How many people are using Puppet DB? Just curious. About a few of you. Sorry, was, was there a question? Yeah, what was that uh, other module? Oh, this is what we're going to get into. The, um, there's, a, there's a Puppet module that's going to kind of enable some of the magic. Um, Dylan, PuppetDB query 1.3.1. It's actually just a module. It's, it's um, a couple of functions and some other, there's a puppet face and there's some other magic that goes along with it. Um, we'll dig into it a little bit and do a quick review of like what that actually, all the great stuff that that gives us. So, PuppetDB, for those of us that aren't using PuppetDB, it's a storage system for collecting all the data that, ge that is generated by Puppet. Puppet generates a lot of stuff, and where are we going to collect all that stuff? <coughs> so PuppetDB is a storage system that stores all of the data, changes everything that, that PuppetDB generates. Um, it's required if we're going to be using some of the advanced, advanced functionality that we're going to be talking about here. Um, really, it gives us a REST interface to access that data, and that's how some of these things are going to work. <coughs> <clears throat> it's kind of like this. Data orchestration, do you get it? <laughs> Think about that for a second, let me drink some water. <laughs> no, I didn't make that. But if you search on uh, Google Images for data playing a violin, this is... <laughs> 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 okay. Um, oops, I have a blank slide there. Uh, so... If you want to know more about Puppet Database or Puppet DB, my friend James did a talk. Uh, it's an hour long. There he is. He's a smart guy, and uh, you can go watch that. Well, this slide will be posted too. It's a good talk, and Puppet DB is a really deep topic. But for our, for our purposes, all you need to know is that it stores a bunch of stuff. So now that you're all experts in Puppet DB, we're going to talk about exported resources in Puppet. And so this is the classic model of how we could collect some information on a set of, or a subset of nodes, and then apply that, or kind of, uh, I guess, subscribe to that information on another set of nodes. Um, the example, I know, it's, it might be kind of hard to read the code, I'm sorry, it, it's a little bit small, but the example in the Puppet documentation, which is a really useful example, is you can use this pattern to collect from all of your machines your SSH host key, and then you can apply it back to your machines. So that way, in your entire infrastructure, you never get that, like, are you sure you want to connect to this machine? This is the first time you're SSHing this machine yes, no thing, which is really annoying. So you can use this, this little incantation, and you get rid of that. Um, but what's happening here is we're collecting some information with the strange double at sign, and then, or sorry, we're declaring it here, and then we're collecting it or realizing it with this strange thing here. It's... it's it's all very odd, but that's what exported resources are, essentially. Um, here's a diagram. I updated this and I laid this over it. Um, we have a number of nodes that we, we, we're, we're collecting, like an Etsy house entry here, and then we're applying it to all of those over there. Um, it might seem a little bit hard to understand because there's some strange vocabulary involved. It works really, really well for some resource types. In the past, there's been some scaling issues. That's why we're only talking about PuppetDB now, because PuppetDB is a lot faster. But it really requires resource types for the things that we want to manage. Now remember, going back many, many slides ago, what a resource type is. User, package, file, right? We need to have like a resource type. So I was asking, is a line in a file, is a single line in a configuration file, is that a resource? Well, there's two modules in the bottom. INI file and concat. And with these modules, you can manage a single line in a configuration file, but it's not pretty. There's another way. So going back to our problem statement, our web server becomes popular, we need to add more web servers, and we want to automatically add web server entries to that HA proxy config file. So um, it's kind of like that, right? We have our users, and we have like one user, and it's pretty light traffic, so we only have two Apache servers. 
this is our hypothetical HA proxy config. HA proxy config is really massive. There's a lot of stuff on the top and the bottom that does a lot of things that I don't really understand. But that's, that's the gist of it. We have our two server entries in our HA proxy config. Now what happens when we ha suddenly have a lot more users, um, we have to add a lot more Apache servers, right? Um, every Apache server that we add, we need to have another entry in the, in the HA proxy config. And we don't want to have to like add IP addresses and things like that. So, yeah, like I said, there's a lot more stuff on the top and on the bottom. This is a really big configuration file. But we're just modeling a single row in this config file. So, this is our example on using the INI setting module. The INI setting module is a great way where we can just manage a single line in a configuration file. And it kind of, it's sort of like using like set or awk. It's like super set and super awk, I guess. Um, in this example, on our Apache module, we are broadcasting. I'm an Apache module, I'm, or I'm an Apache server. I'm going to broadcast this single resource. This is an exported resource. And there's some variables here. I'm sorry, I, I didn't use the uh, public 3.0 uh, variable syntax. Like I said, it's all theoretically perfect code. But <laughs> um, what this is doing, this is broadcasting out into, into the PuppetDB cloud, this is a resource. Over here on our HA proxy config, or on our HA proxy module, we are then realizing everything where tag equals HA proxy. See, we say tag is HA proxy, and then we realize all of the INI setting resources where tag is HA proxy. So, this is, uh, this works. I think it's kind of hard to, to understand, it's kind of hard to follow, and it's not very flexible. It's, we, we're kind of, um, imagine we have two, I mean, this, this, this kind of makes sense, right? We have two different classes of servers. We have our HA proxy server and we have our Apache, our N number of Apache servers. It works, it kind of looks like this. Really, we have like N number of servers and on every server we have that double at sign INI setting that's getting stored. When those nodes are checking in, it's getting stored in PuppetDB. And then we have this double spaceship thing which actually will add those entries. That's essentially exploited resources there's another way. And so this is the module that we were talking about before. From Eric Dillon at Spotify. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name. Um, you can do public module install Dillon Puppet DB query or just clone the get repo. Once you install this, this beautiful bit of code, we get this new function called query facts. So what this will do, when we use this, this function, there's many other parts to it too, but just for the sake of this comparison, we're using query facts, and we want to get a list of the servers in their catalog that have the Apache class assigned to them. And from that list of servers, we want both the host name and the IP address. So first we get a list of the machines that have class Apache, and then we say what data we want from those list of machines. We want the host name and the IP address. Then, in our example, we're passing this variable into our config through the parameterized class. This is our HA proxy. We just say, here's our web servers. Go make this template. And so, really quick. Can I go back? Yeah, sure. Yep, we'll post this. Any any questions so far? If anyone has any questions, just yell or or speak up. Um, so, public data hash data type. Basically, the hash is really powerful. There's some corned beef hash. Um, it's a it's a really powerful data type. And what we can do with the hash is we can have like this nested set of data. So this is. This is an interactive Ruby shell, and so this is kind of simulating what we get back in that web servers variable. Inside that web servers variable, we have two keys. We have server one and server two. And the values for those keys, it's a nested hash, and so we have host name that and IP address that. This is what we get back from that query. And so if we want to iterate over that inside of our template, we can do something like this. I'll, I'll explain why we have to do this keys that sort thing in a moment, but we can just basically say web servers that keys that sort each do this, and then we can access those values and we get this this nice output. 
Um, the reason that we have to sort our keys, I don't want to get too deep into computer science land because it's dark and, and it probably put you all to sleep, um, but hashes are always un unsorted and every time we apply our catalog we're going to get a different order of servers if we just said like put these, these nodes here. So we have to sort the keys and then we have to look up the things based on an alphabetical predictable order. Just do it this way, you can copy the code out of the slides later. So this is now in our ERB file. Inside of our ERB file, we have access to this web server's variable. And we do that same thing. Web servers.keys.sort.each do this. And then here's our line of, of uh, config where we actually look up that host name and we look up that IP address. And this is the end result. So we'll get something like this. Right? So we got the hash out of the PuppetDB or out of the, uh, the PuppetDB query function. And then we can just iterate the hash. Kind of looks like this. Um, every time these nodes check in, they send all their facts and they send their catalog up to PuppetDB. And then when this node checks in, it runs this query facts function, which queries the local PuppetDB for different bits of data and gives us access to that hash so we can make this cool configuration file without having to do the exported resources thing. Okay, so we have two different ways to do it. Why is the PuppetDB query thing better? This is, uh, yes? Um, I'd like to, so are you comparing uh, um, exported resources with PuppetDB? Can you also contrast that with M Collective? Mm -hmm, sure. So the question is, um, I'm comparing exported resources with the PuppetDB query, and how is this different from M Collective? So, um, exported resources still use PuppetDB. The PuppetDB query queries the data of PuppetDB a little bit differently. mCollective is a tool that you can use to kind of dynamically run commands on different machines based on a, a set of conditions. So like if I wanted to restart Apache on all of my nodes that have the Apache class, I can do that. Or if I wanted to run Puppet on all of my production nodes, I could do that. It's not really, it, you can't really write configuration files with it. It's kind of more like an account. Sorry? If you're using Discovery, you can do it. If, if, if you're using Discovery? Yeah, you can do Discovery. Uh -huh. The difference is, is that M Collective requires the node to be online and respond with the actual set of data. You know, it says, which machines out there have this data type, you know, in fact, or something like that. And that's how it goes ahead and knows that it's a production server you told that machine that it is in fact a production server in some way, <coughs> or that it has a FQDN of whatever. So when you say mCollective do X on machines that are in you know, FQDN uh, that include a DC name or something like that or New York, then it goes out to all the machines, all the machines, says, who's got this? And then says, okay, fine, and then comes and goes back. It doesn't necessarily keep a internal database of the uh, well, so, so, so still, still broadcast, broadcast. This yes. doesn't require the other machines to be online at all. Additionally, I'm the kind of person that likes to have like a, a get history of every little thing. And also, I don't let people SSH the boxes. I feel like if you have to SSH the box or even use an mCollective command, that's kind of like opening up the, the sewer hatch and you're digging around in, in things. I like to have everything in Puppet, personally. Yeah. The other thing is if you configure this with MCollective, if you need, let's say your AT proxy crashes, and you need to start the new one, it's not enough to just spin up a new one and add it to Puppet and have it get configured like this. You then have to remember to run this MCollective command, or a or something. Right? Yeah. So you're, you're sort of killing the purpose of using Puppet if you use MCollective. Yeah, it, exactly. It's, it's, it's just kind of a lot more automatic if you're just having everything in Puppet. Uh, personally, I like to use M Collective just for triggering Puppet runs, and like that's kind of about it. Yeah, Jim. Yeah. So, so if I may, M Collective and Puppet are completely different beasts entirely. So what Rob's talking about here is how do we take data that Puppet needs to ensure the configuration state of the system? How do we know what that state is supposed to be? And he's using Puppet DB to collect that data, whereas M Collective is more for orchestrating ad hoc tasks in the system. So say I want to do something right now, you do it with M Collective. Whereas if you say I want a server to look like X, you do it with Puppet. So they're, they're really independent tools in 
higher. So, so if I get that right, but as you as you configure your HA proxy, you probably wanted to know which servers are online. Right. I think and so I right. thought that M Collective was probably a better. So I mean, configuring an HA proxy isn't necessarily saying I know like, which server is currently online because HA proxy has its own health checks. This is more for saying what servers should be online, what servers belong in my pool, and that says what the HA proxy can think is supposed to be. M Collective doesn't really replace the health checks that are built in there. Okay, if we are using our scanner then and storing all the data in the um, clean up, we should make a lot of set of procedures to clean up all the data. Yes, yeah, so in the newest version of PuppetDB, there's a TTL, I think they call it, and so if a node hasn't checked in an N number of units, it will just remove it. There's also a command puppet node deactivate if you want to clean up the old ones, but I tend to just send the TTL to be something really low, like three or four hours. Like if that node hasn't checked in in three or four hours, just remove it from PuppetDB. It's a, it's a configuration setting for PuppetDB. And so it's been a problem in the past with exported resources before PuppetDB where the, the node will be stuck in PuppetDB forever, or sorry, in, in the exported resources active record database like forever and you have to like figure out some way to manually clean it. With PuppetDB you can set like a TTL and so it will automatically remove it if that node hasn't checked in in a number of hours or something. Um, so yeah, like, like good questions. Um, I was going to talk really quick not on topic at all about the anchor pattern, just because it's it always tends to bite people. Um, totally off topic. Um, how many people have used the anchor before? Okay. Oh, what is it? Well, it's really annoying. That's what it is. I have a few other adjectives, but I won't say them. Um, go look at ticket 8040. Basically, what happens is, in our patterns, or in our, in our examples, we're using kind of these subclasses. And what happens, um, if we assign to our node just HA proxy, these other classes float away and become detached from the, the class that we've assigned. So if we say like on our load balancer machine, include HA proxy, and we have this in a very specific order, these other classes become detached. So we have to say anchor and by saying anchor, this is basically like a resource, but it's an empty resource that gets assigned to HA proxy. And this empty resource will then tie these other classes back to this root is class. Is it antithetical to not only anchor, but chain at the same time? Um, you have to chain because the, the, basically we just need to have this first chain. Like this is the, this syntax is like kind of a new style syntax to say requires, and so this is how we say our order inside this class of the things that need to be applied. Fully leverage an anchor in the class. Subclasses. Anchor. Would be the chain. Yeah. 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 Um, I think you need to have at least one. I I get so confused. I'm not the. It's annoying. Go read the go read the book. There's been like large articles written about it. Basically, if you do this, just have one anchor in front of it and anchor this first thing. Otherwise, it's going to apply your stuff in orders that you don't expect. That's that's basically it. So, to sum it up, we have some Latin. Um, <laughs> keep it simple, I guess. And like this is the, the Latin statement that's the basis of Occam's razor. I can't pronounce Latin, but you guys can imagine me pronouncing it. And that's it. Any questions? Um, do you have to use public DB? Can you use like a different database to store the data? Well, the question is, do we have to use public DB? Can you, we use a different database? What public DB is, is a program written in Clojure that is a Lisp variant that runs on the JVM. It acts as a front end to a Postgres database. It has its own internal embedded database that we can use for development and stuff like that. But it basically is just kind of like some smart queuing in a service in front of a Postgres database. It's possible, I guess, to use Oracle. I don't know if it's supported, but you can't use MySQL because MySQL is in a real database. Well, I mean, uh, it's. <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't have some of the features that, that it requires. Um, but I think at this point you have to use Postgres. Yeah. Any other questions at all? Oh, yep. Um, how do you orchestrate quick Additional 
All right, the question is, let's say we want to quickly manage um, sort of a subset of resources very quickly, like we're suddenly adding 10 nodes and we want to quickly add that to our HA proxy. Um, with Puppet, it's a little bit difficult to do that. There's the tag system, and so we can apply our resources with tags, and so when we say Puppet, we can say Puppet agent, dash T, dash, dash tags, this stuff, and we can just evaluate. It still has to connect to the master. The master still has to gener generate the catalog. The catalog is sent over, but when the catalog is applied, it's just gonna apply a subset of the catalog. So if you have some resources that are really slow to apply, you can cut down the application time by doing the dash dash tags. It's not, it's, it, it's a little bit rough still. So the answer to the question is kind of not really, but you might be able to figure out something with getting some tags together. All right, thank you. I'm a professional services engineer with Puppet Labs. Um, this very hastily thrown together talk, which you can tell by the title, is extremely professionally done with really like you know advanced slides and fantastic graphical technique. Um, I just want to talk to you guys a bit about Puppet 3 and and uh, what changes coming about in it uh, and how exactly it works, why you would possibly want to use it. Before I do though, I'm curious, how many people here are running a version of Puppet older than 2.6 right now? Okay, how about older than 2.7? Like 2.6, 2.7. Is anybody here on Puppet 3? And anybody not using Puppet at all? Okay, interesting. Um, so for a lot of you guys, this is not gonna be new information. I wanna talk, I mean, we're gonna talk about mostly things that were released kind of uh, late last year, probably around September in PuppetConf. Um, those of you who are on 2.6, 2.7 or something older and are looking to migrate to Puppet 3, I wanna talk about some of the possible pitfalls. Uh, that you could run into with that. Um, but ultimately, I think Puppet, th Puppet 3 is a pretty neat thing, and uh, you should be on it if you're not already. Uh, if you're a Puppet Enterprise customer, there should be a version coming out pretty soon that includes Puppet 3. Um, I'll, I'll withhold details on that for now. So one of the big things in Puppet 3 is lots and lots of bug fixes. Um, there are a little over 200 bug fixes just in the 3.0 release, and maybe about 100 of them since then. And optimization. Yeah, I'll get there. There are definitely some optimizations, but some of like, the big bugs that, that really bothered me with Puppet 3 is uh, the unpredictable environments is a huge one. So prior to Puppet 3, sometimes you'd get an agent pulling code from an environment that wasn't actually that agent's environment. So if you're using Puppet environments, you might not get the right code, which is horrible. Um, Puppet 3 fixes that, uh, adds warnings for certificate expirations. So this one's kind of interesting because it's been about I don't know, Puppet's been around for a few years. Um, not many people have had Puppet installations that have been running for longer than the five-year certificate expiration. And so a lot of people get completely surprised when all of a sudden their certificates expire and all the nodes stop working. So Puppet 3 fixes that by adding a warning. So you know when your certificate's about to expire, and you can go out and try to fix that. Um, uh, plugin sync failing without a source directory is another interesting one. So since plugin sync was added in Puppet, um, I believe in 2.6 we added it. Uh, you need to have some sort of source directory where the plugins are coming from. And if your agent, if your master has not done its first agent run, it doesn't have that source directory. Uh, so prior to Puppet 3, sometimes you would get failures there where 
The entire thing would error, the catalog would barf, and nothing would work. Puppet 3 fixed that. Uh, and then finally, this one's kind of contentious. Um, I personally disagree with this being a bug when it first came out. Uh, how many people here are using an external node classifier? Foreman or Puppet Enterprise or something like that? So if you set the environment with an ENC and a version of Puppet prior to 3.0, um, you could overwrite that environment from an agent. Now to some people that's good because you want to be able to log into a machine and say, hey, give me a quick run of the dev code on this machine so I can test it out and see how it works. For other people that's really bad because requesting a catalog for a production server will actually possibly expose some kind of security leak or something like that. So the ENC is authoritative as of Puppet 3. As you can see, some of these are pretty long-standing bugs. Um, it's authoritative in Puppet 3, so you cannot override an ENC declared environment come Puppet 3. All right. Um, so another thing, and this is really the big kind of feature of Puppet 3, I would say in general Puppet 3 is not heavy on features. It's mostly like fixing bugs and breaking lots of things. Um, what's that? Optimizing. Yes, optimizing. I'll get there. I have a pretty picture. Uh, so data bindings is, this bit, is the big one here. How many people are using Hira? I'm just going to keep like asking people to raise their hand all night. Not many of you. So Hira is awesome. I think you should use it. Um, if you don't really know what it is, a quick overview is that it's a way to externalize data. Essentially have something else, like a file sitting somewhere that has the data that's going to be used for, uh, for assigning something to your node. So take the classic example of trying to configure NTP, right? You can set up all your Puppet modules and say, this is how I configure an NTP server, this is the config file, the service and the package and all that stuff. Um, and then when you take that module and you apply it in a different data center, you have to put all kinds of conditional logic into your code that says, well, this is how you decide what NTP server goes in this data center. And eventually your code gets really complicated and you need to move the data outside of it. So Hira is a function call, essentially, in Puppet that lets you look up that data from something outside. As of Puppet 3.0, the data is looked up automatically from a parameterized class. So you can see in this example here, I have a class NTP with servers set to, you know, the default NTP servers that may be public. Um, and if I were to say include NTP in a version of Puppet prior to 3.0, this code would not allow me to overwrite whatever those NTP servers would be. Now, as of Puppet 3, higher lookups are done automatically in order to resolve these variables from parameterized classes first. So if I have an NTP server configuration that says my, mine are actually my internal NTP servers, I don't want to use these public ones in my production data center, um, we can simply define that in Hira with the key class name, colon, colon, variable name. And the Hira lookup will automatically overwrite defaults for parameterized classes. Of course, actually explicitly declared parameterized classes will overwrite those Hira lookups. Okay? Yep? So you're saying you don't even have to make function calls to Hira to get the that is exactly what I'm saying, yeah. So, so here, this simple parameterized class will automatically resolve that. You don't have to put the function call at all. Now, for compatibility with versions of Puppet older than 2.7, I do recommend that instead of a static default here, you default to a high recall. So if somebody who's using a version older than 3.0 uh, happens to use your module, it will still work for them and have the same behavior. Okay, hopefully soon that will go away, but there's too many people who aren't using Puppet 3.0 right now for me to be able to recommend writing a module in any other way. Okay, any other questions on data bindings or any of that? Okay, um, so yes, speed improvements. Uh, there is performance increases. I shamelessly stole this picture from, uh, from Adrian Thibault, one of our, was an operations guy at the time that he took this diagram, now he's in engineering. Um, basically, you can see that the catalog compilation times decreased dramatically as a Puppet 3.0. And I'm not going to go into all the specific details of things that were done to make it a lot faster. I'll just say it's a lot faster, and I think that this graph kind of demonstrates that. Uh, you can check out Adrian's blog at something. So it's about, just to sort of distill it to a nutshell, it's about prioritization and sequencing. Yes. The way that resources are compiled. Yeah, it's not, it's not just that. There's some other things, like we found a lot of places where you needed to clip out um, some stuff and make little shortcuts for performance improvements. But yeah, largely that's true. That's, and that's responsible for a lot of the bigger ones. Um, you also find that moving the Ruby 1.9 introduced a lot of performance improvements. So we got a lot of stuff like that. Um, yeah, again, I mean, like that, that graph, I think, is all you really need to know as far as speed improvements. You don't really need to know how under the hood it made it faster. Just trust me, upgrade the Puppet 3, it's faster. Um, so how many people here are using Windows? Again, more hands. Not a single one. Good for you guys. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I want to talk about it really quick because maybe you might find yourself in a place where you are using Windows. And I, and I want a slide for it, damn it. I want to show my slide. Uh, well, they're emailing and matching a team. 
<coughs> there might possibly be whaling and gnashing of teeth. Honestly, guys, Windows is not that bad. <laughs> Who said that? Uh, yeah, okay. So um, this is just a little bit of quick syntactic sugar, is we have a, uh, a new unless in Puppet 3. So if you guys are Rubyists and you like to code in Ruby, I don't know if you do or not, um, you may like the unless statement. You might also really hate it. Um, but this allows you to do something simple and just say, unless conditional, and then run something. So kind of the opposite of an if statement, or running an if not. Um, why would you ever do this? I don't really know, but some people really like doing that, and so that's a new feature in Puppet 3. Um, but ultimately, I think the real reason, if you ask people internally in Puppet Labs, the real reason for Puppet 3 is semantic versioning. Uh, a way to say, basically, we're going to break a lot of shit right now, and that means that we need to switch to some, we can switch to some versioning scheme where we can guarantee you that things will break. So the idea here is we make promises about functionality and compatibility. Do you mean deprecation? Is that no, I mean actually breaking things. Like, like there's a lot of backwards incompatibilities. I'll talk about some of them in a minute. Um, but the idea here is that we have a versioning scheme that now supports that much better. So um, version 3 is a major revision. That means that there are things that break in it that something used to work or worked differently in 2.7 and now it no longer works in 3. That's the major revision. And then we have feature updates, you know, things like we might add some cool new language feature or introduce a deprecation to something, but not actually remove it. Those are the sort of feature releases and then bug fixes, which could just come all the time. For instance, security updates, like in 3.2.2, uh, which you should all get if you're running 3.2.1. Uh, so some commands that got removed, this is a big one. A lot of these have been deprecated for a really long time, like years. Um, if you're running puppet D dash dash test or something like that to trigger puppet, that will no longer work in three. You need to use the full puppet agent style. Likewise, puppet master D is no longer an available command. It needs to be puppet master. And the Welsh command is completely gone. It's been replaced by the puppet resource face. Okay, so definitely check out this stuff. If you have tooling or scripts that are based around those old style commands, Make sure that you upgrade that to the new versions before you go to Puppet 3, okay? Again, I mean, like, the ultimate thing here is just test your code. Make sure that it works on the new version. I don't know if it's kind of a silly thing to suggest. Um, so this is another big one. I think this is the thing that will probably bite people the most if you go from 2.7 to 3 or from some older version to 3 is the removal of dynamic scoping. So the problem here in this Puppet code, who can tell me what the value we're going to get for file.txt is? Anybody? So what's the question again? What value will be the content of file.txt? Is that one top of the What's that? So I hear a lot of uncertainty, and I'm, I'm glad for that, because in versions of Puppet prior to 3, there was some uncertainty. The order that you declared a variable and which scope you declared it in could end up overwriting a variable in another scope. So if you're running an older version of Puppet, the value will be set in class 2. Now for a lot of people, this is a good thing. They would do stuff prior to parameterized classes and set something like uh, have a node level, they would declare a variable and then expect that variable to have the same value at a lower level. Um, that no longer works in 3.0. Scoping is restricted to class scope, node scope, and top scope only. And then scopes are inherited through, or uh, variable values are inherited, but they don't automatically fall down. So the value in Puppet 3.0 is something that's a lot more predictable. It will say top scope here. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Or did you like have a hard time tracing through that spaghetti code there? Sorry? No this. Yeah. You still reference uh, the top level by doing Yes. So, so for proper style, we would we would explicitly scope these variables. We would say, you know, dollar colon colon whatever the value is. Now, in the case of class one, you can't actually get the value of some content out of class two unless you also include class two and class one, uh, and then reference two colon colon some content. Um, but but here this will this will behave predictably in in uh, Puppet 3.0, and the file from temp one will actually be from the top scope value. Yep. Correct. So in Puppet three, you'll get the value from top scope. In older versions, you'll you, for 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 class one, it will go all the way to top scope. This won't override factor. 
None of these override factor. I'm talking here of just specifying specific facts. Now, granted, since I'm not using, I should have, I should have scoped my variables in this. It would be what? Well, facts are variables. So um, I probably should have scoped these. It would make it make for a lot less confusion. Uh, in fact, even with dynamic scoping enabled, uh, if I said dollar colon colon some content here, I would never get a value overridden from class two. So, I mean, a lot of people were relying on this functionality is the reason why I bring it up here. Granted, this is horrible style, and you should definitely reference variables explicitly. Um, that goes for facts, too, which is the uh, FQDN thing that Rob was talking about in his previous uh, in his presentation. Yep? So if you have top scope equal top scope, right, and then you have known scope equal known scope, will you actually get the known scope variable in this example? I'm not sure I, I get your question. So top scope, scope equal. Known definition, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say you create a variable for some content, mm -hmm. and then you, if it's known underscore scope, right, and then you call these. You actually, because right now class one, it looks like it's going all the way to the top score. But then if you have a variable with the same name under the node scope, so you actually get the content from the node scope's variable. So in that case, yes, it will get it from the node scope variable because it's declared at that level, unless we explicitly call out top scope. Um, again, this is bad code here specifically because we're referencing a variable in another scope without explicitly scoping it. But as a Puppet 3, the way that it will fall through is it will look for a local sum content, it'll look for a node scope sum content, and then it will look for a top scope sum content. Yeah, Matt? Um, there isn't a, a nice way to like, reference node scope, right? A nice way? No, there isn't. If you're, if you're trying to find that, that, if you're trying to find like a difference between top scope and node scope, no, there's not. Sounds like a module. What sounds like a module? Or parts of the somewhere. Possibly, although I think uh, the syntax word is not really well known. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the point that I'm trying to make here, if you guys have more questions about this stuff, feel free to grab me after, but I, I, I gave myself a limited amount of time for this and I'm already running out. So um, check your catalogs. If you're going to move from Puppet older than three to Puppet three, I recommend you spin up a separate master and run a couple of nodes against that first and make sure that nothing changes. And if it does, you're gonna to need to work through your code. Also pay attention to deprecation warnings. 2.7 has a lot of them that will really break your day if you move that code to 3.0 without further checking. Okay? Um, so I've got some more, more, stuff, more links here. Um, you can just look at these and memorize them. So I won't give you the slides, of course. Um, Basically, docs.puppetlabs.com, um, there is a lot, a lot, a lot of detail about Puppet 3 for what sort of changes there are, is, and very specific lists of all the things that will break. Um, Adrian's blog, which I stole that performance picture from, gives a great list of things to do as you're migrating and how to watch out for Puppet 3. Um, and of course, there's a good blog post highlighting some more of these features better than, than I possibly could. And of course, semver.org, which is sort of guiding the, uh, the Puppet versioning from here on. Okay, so um, one last thing, and this is, this is really brand new, this is not something that's like an old recycled feature, is we're working on a new experimental uh, parser um, that we started introducing in Puppet 3.2. So if you enable something, uh, if you enable parser equals future in your puppet.conf file on a machine that's running Puppet 3.2 or later, you actually get access to a number of iteration features, which is I know something that a lot of people were, were really asking for. Yeah? I was asking for that. Okay, so set, set parser equals future in puppet.conf and you, you may very well have it. Um, we're actually looking for feedback on this stuff, so if you guys want to check out the experimental 3.2 features page uh, and look at that and see what kind of syntax makes sense for you using iteration. Because obviously Puppet being a declarative language, it makes it kind of difficult to, to sort of define a way to, to iterate, right? You know, you're not, you're not running a sequence of commands, and so you have to kind of think of the manifest now as a language for how do you define uh, building a catalog as opposed to... If you, if you provide people to the opportunity to change or sequence uh, these resources, do you also need the ability to iterate? Well, so, okay, so this, this is, we're going to get into a philosophical discussion here, but um, the, idea, the idea of resource chaining is not so much deciding order, but it's deciding dependencies. It's saying this or, this resource requires that resource in order to work. So Ordering is done is or, is done entirely through the graph. Sorry, was it? No. no? Okay. Um, 
Oh yeah, well I didn't do it, so thanks somebody else. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, here, here it is, like, these are some of them. There's a couple more out there that you can check out. Um, I don't think I really have time to, to demo any of these, although I can show anybody who wants to, to grab me after, give more time for Brian's talk. Are there any other questions on this? So I will add that, um, like everybody else here, Puppet Labs is also hiring. Um, if you go to puppetlabs.com slash careers, you'll see a list of all the many, many open positions we have. Um, we do have some people working remotely from, from New York, so you don't necessarily need to move to Portland, although it's a pretty fun place, so maybe you'll want to. Move to Portland. Yeah. Z Zach, by the way, is a support engineer of ours that lives in Portland, so you can ask him any of this stuff, too. Actually, all the tough questions, send his way. I'm going to be drinking beer. Okay, thanks, guys. services? About a third? Okay, so this, if you don't use Amazon Web Services, you can leave. No, I'm just yeah. um, This is very specific to Amazon Web Services. It's a service to provision programmatically uh, resources within Amazon, uh, like Puppet is a tool to resource to provision resources within an operating system. So, um, basically a service, what is, what is it? A service used to, collect, to manage collections of other AWS services. Um, here's like a kind of, I stole this from Jeff, um, the AWS evangelist, and it kind of talks about, uh, you have a desired architecture uh, with interconnections between them. You write that as a template, pump it into CloudFormation service, it generates a resource list, uh, it can notify you when it's done provisioning, and you can have pretty much almost all the, or all of the AWS services you're familiar with, e ELB, uh, auto scaling groups, uh, database instances, but I'll get into the full list in a bit. Um, so what are the features? So it has atomic execution with a full transactional rollback, so if any um, resource fails to provision, it will roll back the whole stack and consider it a failure. Uh, it, it supports multiple availability zones. Um, a, it's no longer a new feature, but uh, they added the ability to add and delete resources from existing uh, stacks. Um, and there's a metadata service for configuring EC2 nodes. So. You can use that metadata to do some basic provisioning, uh, or you can use that metadata to pass things on to Puppet or other to Chef or whatever. So um, there's a, the components. It consists of a template, which is basically the code to describe your um, stack, and the stack is uh, your a relate a connection of related resources that you want to provision together. So it's attributes like Puppet, it's a declarative language. Like Puppet, it's item potent. Unlike Puppet, it's a JSON based DSL, but Puppet is a DSL. So it has some similarities, but it's uh, 
solving a different problem set. Um, I'm not going to go through this full list, but trust me, they're all almost all of them are there that I know of. Um, the big ones is uh, S3, EC2, you know, RES if you're using that. Um, I mean, you pre you pretty much it's all in here, so I'm not going to, you know, read up the list. But so the components of a template parameters are basically inputs into your template. Like you can feed, you can quite, you could ask the user. You could give a, an input of what availability zone do you want to do this in, or what type of instance, for example. Uh, mappings are data mappings that you can use, like for example, what I'll, I'll show in a template later is you take an input uh, availability zone and based on that, I'll map it to a specific AMI because you can't mount an AMI from one availability zone to another. Uh, or, or no, region, I'm sorry, region, not availability zone. Maybe. If you had an AMI, if you could have a mapping that says, oh, what region am I in? And then based on that, you can pick the appropriate AMI. Um, resources are just resources. They're S, like EC2 instances, S3 buckets, that kind of stuff. Um, outputs, so you can spit out something at the end. Say, hey, here, here, here's the DNS name I provisioned for your, uh, um, your, your, your Drupal server or whatever. So, and, uh, let's go back into full present. Okay, so here's an example parameter. Um, I mean, you're going to put the name of the parameter, uh, and you, have, you put a description. This is, uh, you know, it's a a name of an existing EC2 key pair. Like you basically want to allow them to input what EC2 key pair you want to provision nodes with, and later you would use that parameter in a uh, EC2 instance um, resource type. So, uh, like it's a string. You can set a min length, max length, length. You can allow the pattern. This is a regex, um, and you can have a description that's displayed. Upon uh, you know when you run it, and it'll say this. I mean that's fairly self-evident. Okay, so here is uh, an example of a mapping that I kind of talked about earlier. So this is um, you know the, the, the based on the um, the regions, the bit side, uh, the, the bittedness of the. Um, AMI type and then the AMI instance ID. So, like, not many people know that 64 bit is used across the board. Not that many people use 32 bit, but you never know. So, here's another example resource. This is uh, a database instance of RDS type. Um, it's basically, if you think, if you've ever used the API, it's kind of the fields that you plug into the API, you know, that are attributes for a given resource type. Like, you give it a name. MySQL, uh, you can give it a DB username, um, instance class, uh, security groups. So, um, I, mean, I think these, these are referencing, uh, you know, like variables. So, I mean, you set them somewhere else. But, um, I mean, it's basically this is, I'll show some more. I'm going to do a, I'm going to go through. Question? Yeah, sure, so go ahead. Aren't all of these variables? And no, it's published in the like each resource type has so CloudFormation. Each resource type is documented what their attributes are, and yes, they are subject to change, but generally they're not backwards making breaking changes. You know, so they might say we now support uh, like a the block. You can select the blue boot block parameters where you couldn't do that before. They're kind of adding, expanding the features as you go along as they enhance cloud formation. So, I mean, does that kind of answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, here's an example output. I, I mean, I kind of went into this a little bit, but um, if you were to setting up a Route 53, you, you could have it spit out the name of the DNS for it. So, I'm going to... Um, Actually, I'm going to actually 
Let's do, see if I can do this. Let's go. Yes. Alright, I'm not going to necessarily go through this fall on detail. This is a, a template uh, for spinning up a single Cassandra seed yes. server. A, a, a template, a cloud formation template. Um, I'm making it a little bigger so you guys can see it. Is that too? Is can you guys in the back? Can you see that? Yeah. One more. Yeah. I, I cannot control the brightness of this screen or the contrast of this screen here. It's pretty bright on mine. But, um. <laughs> All right. Uh, so um, All right, so when you create a, uh, a template, you're going to give it a version. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, so how much of this did you actually write by hand? What do you mean by hand? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you include cutting and pasting, pretty much all of it. Oh, but that's I, not <coughs> uh, okay, thanks. Okay. Brian Jensen's JSON the quill, actually. <laughs> 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 Actually, what would be the alternative? Because there may, there may be a solution for you. You can actually take a running set of resources and have it spit out what it believes to be a template that would get you to that state. And then you can edit it from there. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is not a real production template I use. I, I wrote it for demonstration purposes. Um, I kind of, I wrote it to learn confirmation, like when I learned confirmation, uh, but um, it's not very useful, it's just a single Cassandra seed server, so uh, you can take it from there, but it has a lot of examples of all the things we've gone through. So this is a, a key name, don't ask me why I use Drupal demo key pair, it's, I've given AWS demos at a Drupal group, so I created a key pair for that. So uh, name of an existing SSH key pair. We, we kind of went over um, what uh, parameter is and all these kind of things in the parameter. Um, and, and by the way, going back to your question earlier, see where it says the template format version? That is kind of how it decides to parse it, based on that. Um, so we, this is another thing I'm prompting for the instance type. Um, I set a default, which you're allowed to do. I recommend you do if you... Uh, when it, and you can have, you can set a lot of values, so it does um, it'll it'll throw an error if you try to set in something that's like a well I'm going to set an M7 you know quintuple extra large or something that doesn't exist you know so um, it'll just throw it back until you put in right one or cancel uh, so then uh, availability zone you know uh, you might not necessarily want to prompt people for this or you might have whatever, but in this case, I, set, I do believe I set a default. I'm sorry, I wasn't speaking to the mic. Um, so here's some security group IDs. I, I basically have a default one for this one. It's Cassandra. You can override it if you want because it is a parameter. Um, and then here's some mappings. Since it's all 64-bit um, and we're basically doing it so I used to have it like a double set of mappings where I would uh, have 64 and 32, but I, I, I kind of, I could, I could compress these two mappings into one now. So, um, but uh, here's like, these are Ubuntu 11.04 AMIs, which poses a problem when I get to the demo later because they're really old. Um, so this is a... Cloud formation user. This is an AAM user that's allowed to run the cloud formation helper stuff. And it, 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 does everybody know what IAM is? All right, cool. Anybody want to know what it is? Okay, identity and access management within um, AWS. It's basically the role based access controls. You can define very granular roles, and some of those roles are like basically. 
I want to be able to have my EC2 um, node be able to interact with the API and do stuff. I mean, this is kind of where this is going here. Because there's, there's another set of, there's a package that you can install on a, a Linux server called CloudFormation Helper Scripts. And they basically allow you to pull metadata that you pass to the node through CloudFormation and configure your node. The most useful thing to do is to configure the node enough to run uh, a configuration, a real configuration management framework, like Puppet, you know, so. So, host keys is related to the user. Um, those are like the API keys and things. Um, Cassandra seed server, here, here we go with a, a, a actual um, EC2 instance resource. So, uh, I have the config. This config piece is used by the CloudFormation helper scripts. Um, it's, it's, but it's metadata, basically. So, I'm telling you, I want this file, and I want this content, and, and by the way, it does support functions. So, it's kind of cool. Um, so I'm joining these two um, <coughs> lines to make this file content, and it's basically I'm adding a source to pull in the Cassandra packages um, from Apache, and then you can set this is this should look a little familiar for those who use Puppet, but you know mode owner group whatever. Um, so it's, it's basically a file resource in you know CloudFormation speak. Uh, so the properties, so here's, uh, this is kind of the image ID, uh, the metadata, and this is actually like about the instance. So we have, um, now we're doing a function, we're looking at a map, and we're basically pulling up the AMI. Uh, it, it's actually a double map call, but I, like I said earlier, I could have compressed it into one call. Um, but it, it, at the end of the day, it's basing it on the, the instance type and the region to figure out uh, what AMI ID. And then the architecture, and then no, this is, and it passes the architecture too, I'm sorry. And then the instance type, we, we're referencing our parameter instance type, our key name, we're referencing our key name, uh, availability zone, these are all references, availability zone, security groups, um, then we have the, the user data, um, I'm passing it, who, who knows uh, like a user data script? Do you, everybody know what that is? So in Amazon world, you can pass an EC2 instance, a small shell script, and it will run it. You can also pass it other sorts of data, but your instance needs to know what to do with it. Almost all uh, variants of Linux that are supported on AWS that have been there for a while know how to deal with user data and user data scripts. Um, typically, that's done through the cloud init, frank, uh, you know, uh, package, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so I'm down here. So this this shell script uh, signals a wait handle, which I'll define later. But basically, I mean, it defines the, the a function error exit. This is shell function. It's really weird to write shell scripts like this embedded in JSON. <laughs> uh, so I'm just warning you now. Uh, try to do. You're probably going to want to develop a shell script that gets you up and running on Puppet, and then pass it all off onto Puppet, and then use that same one on every EC2 instance. Um, so basically. Because this is Ubuntu, it doesn't have a native CloudFormation helper script, so I have to install it manually, and there's no package for it either, so I have to install it um, using Python, easy install. So, yeah, it's hackery, but. What? You could do that, but then I couldn't show it to you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, so this is this is where I'm initiating it, and this is what that the, the stuff I defined up here, uh, right here, the fi files, and you can do more than files. You can do like packages and other things too. 
Um, but because I had to manually install the CloudFormation helper scripts, I just wanted to show a little bit of an example here. Um, I could have actually done this right in the script, but I just wanted to show this piece. Um, so that init, that CFN init is what will get it to run once and put those things up there in place. Then I just update the, the, um, the, the packages uh, list and then do a dist upgrade. I'm, I'm in the demo, it kind of hangs for a long time because I'm using uh, 1104 AMI. So I'll show you a little bit of the demo, but it's not gonna, we're not going to wait for it to finish instantiating because that's a big app get thing to do. Um, so this is basically just some GPG commands to get uh, it to trust the Apache packet um, repos. Um, and then once the repo is added, we do another update. And then we install Cassandra, stop Cassandra. I kind of did this, I started doing this to clear it out and actually see if we can make it useful, but. This is a pass, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's why you're doing this stuff here and not doing like public. This is just a CloudFormation demo. <laughs> okay? In production, when I use CloudFormation, the only thing I use it for is to get Puppet installed. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then I have a like I have like a massive CloudFormation template that spins up like a bunch of nodes and auto scaling groups and they all and, and it, put, it, it puts in custom um, puppet, uh, what are those things? They mention them, L loader, um, never mind. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's custom facts, uh, uh, the plugin, uh, plugin sync, yeah. So I'm just, this is just like a self contained example, like kept trying to go through a whole big puppet. Here's the puppet master. Here's the clients. Here's all the different security groups. Could take like two hours to go through. So I mean, for how big of an inventory service? What? How many servers are we talking about? In and that I've done with so you say a couple hours. Is that one server or is that? Any I mean, in a demo to go through a CloudFormation template that's a, a very complex environment could take a long time to actually just walk through the template. Yeah. Okay, so how, how many nodes are we talking about? I mean, a, a cloud formation template can define auto scaling groups, which can be hundreds of nodes, you know, thousands of nodes. You know, it's, there's no real limit other than your account limits, you know. So, um, so and this is a signal, this is the function I defined earlier. That lets, uh, this is the weight handle where it lets it let CloudFormation know, hey, I finished bootstrapping, continue on if you had any dependencies waiting on me. So it does orchestration as well. It's, and this is where I define those uh, conditions and handles. Uh, and it has a timeout, so if it doesn't do it in you know, 10 minutes or whatever that is, 60, 20 minutes. So, and then the output, I just output the DNS name of the um, Cassandra seed server, which will just be one of those crazy EC2 names. Go ahead. Uh, what's the advantage of using something like CloudFormation as an Amazon software? Well, this came first. I don't know how it works. And OpsWork is built on, right now, built on Chef. I haven't learned it yet, so I can't speak for OpsWorks. I think OpsWorks focuses more on uh, node provisioning. I know OpsWorks was a separate company that uh, Amazon bought for dev workflows. So, I don't know. I don't think they're going to kill this off anytime soon. Uh, so, if you're using Puppet, this works with Puppet. If you're not and you want to play with Chef, go and play it with OpsCode, or OpsWorks. It's sequential launching, but unless you have dependencies, it'll just move on to launch the next thing. You know what I'm saying? 
will be able to create 10 instances in parallel? Well, there's one way you can do that. You can instantiate an auto scaling group. With auto scaling, there is no way. No, no, with an auto scaling group, if you said I want an auto scaling group with 10 instances. But in all in all cases, we have five different servers. But you want to have them watch like five minutes or less. Yeah, if we want they all do two different things, but I mean, if we could do it one after another, it would take 30 minutes to speed up. Right. I mean, typically when I launched, I never. I, I've always been like had dependencies in the stuff I've written and it was never I needed a whole environment spun up real quick it was just like I want to be able to describe it all you know I don't know but I do know one of the resource types it can instantiate is a is a cloud formation stack and if you didn't have dependencies it could maybe spin up another stack I mean, you know, so you could have like five stacks spinning up. I, I mean, for five instances, I'm certain I could do it in five minutes. You know. So, so that includes parallelization. I, I believe so. I, I think the calls are not technically in parallel. It makes the calls, but it, it, can, it, can, it can do it asynchronously and wait for. The, you know, you don't have to have wait conditions and hooks and all that stuff. You know, so you can just launch, 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 and wait for the calls. But everything I've written has been sequential, like wait for this to finish, and if that finishes, take the output of this and plug it into that, you know. So, I haven't figured out how to do branch prediction yet in uh, cloud formation spinners. Pardon? Yeah. Yeah. So, any other questions? I think we're done for tonight. Um, does anybody have any questions for any of the other speakers? All right. Where are we drinking? That's my question. Antarctica. Antarctica. <laughs>